lecture series. Please, Steve. All right, thank you. Um, we had a little technical difficulty with the transparencies, but I think we've sorted it out. Um, okay, today <coughs> I'm going to talk about uh, mean value theorems. So I talked about moments, mean values yesterday a little bit. And uh, uh, I mentioned that these are really an important tool in all of analytic number theory. So I want to give you some sense of how they're used, let you actually see uh, <coughs> them used as a tool to prove some very uh, important results. Okay, so first, uh, what do I mean by a mean value theorem? <coughs> Okay, so in general, if you think of, say, a, a function, an analytic function that's, you know, given by a power series maybe, uh, then um, the, uh, the integral around a circle uh, centered at z naught, that's a mean value theorem if you have, a, if you have an estimate for that. Um, let's see. Is there a, a clicker, a laser pointer I could use? Okay, but we're dealing with Dirichlet series, uh, so uh, generally the important thing is, since they live in half planes rather than uh, disks, um, uh, to integrate along a vertical line. So if you have a function, it could be the zeta function, an L function, or something much more complicated, uh, then uh, this is what we mean by the mean square uh, of uh, F. So sigma, it depends on sigma, you fix a, uh, a, an ordinate and then integrate from zero to capital T. And you, you're interested in the behavior as T goes to infinity. <clears throat> Here we have something without the mean square, just an average of F. Okay, and uh, one thing to keep in mind is that the, the function, the, where, where you're integrating may not be in the domain of absolute convergence of, uh, of the series. Okay, um, so, um, you know, you have to have some other way to, to express it. And also, when I say mean, usually you think, well, I should divide by the length of the interval, t, and we just sometimes just uh, don't do that. Sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. Okay. So here are, here's another type of mean that comes up. Uh, discrete mean. So um, you may have a set of points in a half plane, sigma r plus i t r. They may not be on a line. And let's say you want the mean square of f uh, over that set of points. Okay, so that, that, that's an important thing too in some, sometimes. <clears throat> so here's a, a more concrete example. If we take f to be the kth, mom the kth power of zeta, and we think of sigma as being bigger than or equal to half. K is a positive integer, let's say. Um, I sub K of sigma T, I'll call, I'll use that throughout this lecture. That's the uh, mean square of the kth power. So that's the same as the two kth moment of zeta that I was talking about yesterday. This is on the sigma line, okay? And I mentioned that the half line, sigma equals a half, <coughs> is, uh, the, the, uh, is, is uh, the most complicated case usually. Um, here's another example. If we take the kth power of the derivative of zeta, uh, and maybe we sum over the zeros of the zeta function, okay? And on or off the Riemann hypothesis, maybe. Uh, so if S is the set of zeros, you can ask what's the average value of the derivative of the zeta function. And these things are all used in the subject, so you'll see a little later exactly how. <clears throat> okay, now here's an example where we have uh, a, just a, a general Dirichlet polynomial. 
It is a, a truncation of a Dirichlet series. Okay, and we, uh, it's a, a, a common to want to know uh, what's the mean square of this Dirichlet polynomial. And classically, you can, this is a, a good exercise you can try. Um, classically, you can find a general formula that looks just like this. Okay, it's not hard to prove, just by hand. Um, there's a stronger version that's, that's uh, used most of the time uh, due to Montgomery and Vaughan. <coughs> it's, a, it's a bit of an improvement, and uh, it looks like this. Okay, and actually this is true for an infinite series as well, provided both sides converge. So <coughs> the uh, mean square of the Dirichlet polynomial is the sum of the squares of the coefficients over n to the 2 sigma times t, the length of the interval of integration, plus big O of n. So uh, one thing to note from this is that this big O of n is uh, at most big O of capital N, and if capital N is little o of t, then uh, this big O of n term is little o of t, and so you have an asymptotic formula. On the other hand, if big N is bigger than t, let's say t to the 1 plus epsilon, it could happen that, um, that this term dominates the first term, and you, don't, you, lose, you may get an upper bound, but you don't get an asymptotic generally. <clears throat> okay, so keep in mind this, this mean value formula of Montgomery and Vaughan. Now let me quickly remind you of a couple of things from yesterday. Uh, the first is Jensen's formula. <clears throat> um, so uh, one of the ways, one of the reasons we're interested in mean values and the growth of, of uh, our functions is because there's a connection to the zeros inside a region. So, uh, let me just remind you what uh, Jensen's formula looked like. It was here. So, the average of the log of f around a circle uh, is related to uh, the distribution of the zeros inside the, the circle. Okay? And I also mentioned that uh, Littlewood's theorem is the one that's the form that's of, of this principle that's generally used in analytic number theory because we're dealing with Dirichlet series and they naturally reside on half planes. So here's a reminder of what Littlewood's theorem says. <coughs> uh, if f is analytic and non-zero on a rectangle, and uh, what I mean by that is actually it's, you know, it's analytic in a, an open set containing that rect, excuse me, that rectangle, uh, then two pi times the sum of the distances of the zeros of f inside, the distances to the left edge, is equal to the log of f on the left edge, and then it's minus the, sorry, the integral of the log, minus the integral of the log on the right edge of the rectangle, and then uh, these terms come from uh, in the part of the integral of the log on the top and bottom of the rectangle. <clears throat> Actually, so here's have a uh, diagram of this. Okay, so uh, you integrate f, you integrate f log f along here, and uh, broken up along the sides, um, and then taking imaginary parts, you get this expression on the right, and that's equal to. 2 pi times the sum of these lengths, where the rows are zeros inside the rectangle. Okay, so that was Littlewood's theorem. And uh, let's see. <coughs> let me give you, let me try to give you a quick uh, proof of Littlewood's lemma, just uh, so that you understand where this comes from. Um, so, uh, let's see. It's a little tricky, but so here's here's a here's a diagram. Um, <clears throat> I want to integrate log f around this contour, where I make little cuts to the zeros of of the function inside. 
okay? In this case, there's two zeros inside. So this contour with the cuts, with the loops taken out, uh, and here are the loops. So if I add them in, if I add these geometric loops back in, I get a, a rectangle. I'll call that C, and this, this contour that you see here is C prime. Okay, now if I take log of F and I integrate it around this contour C prime, I get zero because log of F is analytic in here. I've, I've removed singularities. The zeros of F uh, give you problems uh, when you take the log. So um, the integral around C prime of log F is zero. Okay. So if you if you uh, integrate around the the whole rectangle, so that's no no loops involved. That's the integral around the the, the rectangle with the the loops removed, plus the integral with the loops added back in. Okay, so integrate along those those little loops. Okay, now, uh, as I mentioned, log f is analytic inside C, the rectangle with the loops removed, so that part is zero. So this term is zero. Okay? So the integral around the rectangle, the complete rectangle, is the sum of the integrals along the loops. Okay, so now let's evaluate what a typical integral on a loop is. The integral will be, uh, so you go out, Maybe I can put the picture back here. Yeah, okay, so um, you integrate along the loop this way, okay? So we're going from, th this left edge is sigma naught, let's say, okay? and. Uh, beta is the uh, real part of the zero row. Okay, so uh, the first integral here is the integral on the bottom edge of the loop till you get a little bit away from the zero, um, okay? So that's what this, this minus means, you're on the bottom of the loop. Then you integrate around this circle, that's the second integral, and then uh, you need to integrate uh, along this part of the loop, the top edge of the loop. Now, you're going this way, so that's minus the integral going this way to the right, all right? And since you're on the top of the loop, you integrate log f of sigma plus i gamma plus. That's what I mean by the plus and minus, okay? Okay, now, um, we're almost done. This just means, uh, if, you, if you look at this term, um, how do you get this term? What, what is f of sigma on the top edge? Well, uh, to go f if you go from here around here, there's an increase of the argument of, uh, of uh, f by 2 pi i, okay? So this integrand is the same as this integrand, the one, the one you know, along the, sorry, the one along the top is the same as the one along the bottom except for a factor of 2 pi i that you have to add in because you've gone around the loop. Okay, now also uh, log f, f has a zero, and r is small here, f has a zero at row, so, so this term is a singularity, log of a zero, uh, so that's minus, it's going to minus infinity, but um, you're multiplying by an r when you, um, you know, go around the circle, and this r goes to zero faster than the log, so this term goes to zero when r goes to zero. So that term vanishes. Okay. So uh, what you end up with is that the integral around the loop is the integral along the bottom part and the top part, and the two are the same except for uh, a 2 pi i because you've gone around the loop. So that's what you see here. And you're integrating along an interval of length uh, beta minus sigma naught. So the loop integrals contribute this, and therefore the integral around the whole rectangle of log f 
is minus 2 pi i times the sum of these loop integrals, okay? Um, so you have this, and then if you take imaginary parts, then you get minus 2 pi times the sum here, and then you just take imaginary parts of these. So here, the imaginary part of this first term um, is just, uh, you know, uh, um, you know, the real part of this log, so that's log mod f, and so on for the other terms. Okay, uh, <coughs> f for a Dirichlet series generally is decreasing as you move to the right, so log of f, this integral is small compared to the first integral on the left edge. Also, yesterday I proved that s of t, the, the uh, argument of the zeta function uh, at, at, up at height t, uh, was bounded by log t. The proof I gave you there applies to uh, many of these functions, these Dirichlet series that have finite order, that is, they're bounded in strips by uh, a power of t. Uh, this, the same proof that works there shows that these, the, the terms, actually, let me go to the next slide where I have it written uh, exactly. Okay, when you take imaginary parts of, of the formula we had, this is what you get, some of these terms. The argument of f will be big O of log t for the functions we're usually interested in, okay? So that's why uh, you can think of Littlewood's lemma as saying uh, that 2 pi times the sum of the distances to the left edge of the rectangle is the integral along the left edge of log mod f plus some negligible terms. These are log t at most, well, this guy is, and this is, this is sometimes even big old one. <laughs> okay, so that's a proof of Littlewood's uh, formula. Um, uh, there's a complication here that you, may have occurred to you. Uh, generally speaking, how, how are you gonna find the integral of log of some complicated function uh, this is not a, an untrivial thing, usually. So, uh, we have a trick. So, and I'll, I'll apply this uh, in a couple of cases later. Uh, the trick is this. The average of a log of a function, since the log is a, let's see, is that convex or concave? You know, it goes like this. Uh, so, it's Jensen's inequality. Uh, not, not Jensen's theorem that we've talked about here, but, uh, the average of the log is less than or equal to the log of the average. Okay, this is true for convex or concave functions, whichever we're talking about here. Um, okay, so uh, you can apply that here. Uh, the log of the modulus of f is one half the log of the modulus of f squared. The two just comes out and cancels. Okay, so I have a one half here. And uh, this, this is the, so the, this is one half the average of the log of this function, f square, mod f square. That will be less than or equal to the average of the log. Uh, no, the average of the log is less than or equal to the log of the average. Okay, so you have this. And so here you see the kind of mean squares that we talked about before. We can apply Montgomery Vaughan or other mean value estimates to this integral here. Okay, so now you know everything you need to know about Littlewood's lemma, or theorem. Now, let me give you some basic results about mean values because I want to use them uh, in, in some of the applications I'll show you. <clears throat> so remember, IK sigma t is just the mean two kth power of zeta on the sigma line. If k is one and sigma is bigger than a half, uh, we're looking at this, and it turns out this is not hard to prove. Um, this is a, some constant depending on sigma times t, okay? So uh, keep in mind that the mean square here, if you're to the right of the half line, is, is about t in size, okay? And then, uh, Remember, Hardy and Littlewood proved if sigma is a half, then you have that the, the mean square is t log t. Okay, the, if you compare these two results, you already see some information, interesting information about the zeta function. Namely, on the half line, this is significantly bigger than this. 
than this is for sigma fixed to the right of a half. Okay, so uh, the modulus of zeta is big on the half line, or you know, it gets a lot bigger than to the right. But th we know the zeta function has lots of zeros on the half line, so it's got to get really big and really small in modulus. So it's got to behave rather erratically. Okay, in other words, it's complicated. Okay, so so uh, there you see one uh, quick way to read off information from mean value theorems. Um, when k is 2, when k is 2, um, if you're, t again, to the right of a half, then uh, the f mean fourth power, the fourth moment, is, again, another constant times t. And uh, yesterday I told you Ingham proved that on the half line it's t over 2 pi squared log to the fourth t. If k is bigger than 2, <coughs> um, we don't have an asymptotic on the half line. And in fact, we don't have an asymptotic if you're too close to the half line. But um, if you get, move a little bit away, depending on how big k is, uh, then again, this formula, a constant times t, is the correct answer. OK, and then. Uh, Let me move on. Okay. Uh, now, here's another important mean value, type of mean value that comes up. So I just want to mention it briefly before we see it used. Uh, here I'm taking zeta, and I'm multiplying it by a Dirichlet polynomial. And uh, one, uh, one possibility might be something like this. This is a, a weight that helps regularize the sum, make it a little uh, easier to handle technically, uh, smooths out irregularities. Um, and if you, if you ignore this weight, mu of n over n to the s, this is a truncation of 1 over zeta. So if you were to the right of 1 and n was large, zeta times mn uh, would be about 1. I mean, 1 plus a little bit. And it turns out that if you move into the critical strip, this uh, phenomenon this, uh, that, that m is behaving like 1 over zeta still holds in a sense. Uh, for instance, in mean square, it's, getting, it's sort of like 1 over zeta. So uh, we call this a mollifier, uh, and we use it when we have to apply inequalities like Cauchy-Schwartz. When you, when you use Cauchy-Schwartz, you lose a lot if the uh, two functions you're, you're uh, splitting up <coughs> uh, are, are not connected, if they're not proportional. So uh, it's good to try to uh, find something that that's, uh, uh, smooths out any big jumps. Okay, that, that helps in applying Cauchy-Schwartz, for example. Um, okay, so uh, there are all kinds of mean value theorems known for these. They're hard work. Uh, Levinson uses them in his, his paper uh, showing a third of the zeros at least are on the critical line. And um, uh, Brian Connery and Omit Ghosh and I uh, used, uh, proved a lot of theorems like this for use in, in um, uh, some work we were doing years ago. Uh, so sometimes you might want a, a, a derivative of zeta instead of just zeta, but still you might mollify by m. Um, and uh, one point to keep in mind is that there's a technical bar. As long as n, the length of the polynomial, is at most t to the half. So I'm measuring, <coughs> I'm letting n be t to the theta here and taking theta uh, less than a half. Usually we can work this out without much uh, too much difficulty. Um, if you want to go beyond a half, uh, then you have to use higher power methods. Like, uh, and Brian Connery used, did exactly that to get to improve Levinson's constant from a third to uh, uh, three fifths. Uh, uh, two, two fifths. <laughs> three fifths is coming, I suppose. Uh, 
uh, he, he uh, was able to take theta less than four sevens using Klusterman sum techniques, very technical stuff. Okay, and then one, <coughs> one more thing I want to mention is that uh, here's an example of these mean, mollified means. This is of zeta prime this time, um, times uh, something that mimics one over zeta. Right? And you can handle things like this, too, if theta is less than a half. Okay, so now, concrete applications. I mentioned zero density estimates uh, yesterday. So those were, <coughs> if, you, if you look in a region to the right of a half, so take a, fix a sigma bigger than a half, and go up to height t, how many zeros are in that, that rectangle, that part of the critical strip? And um, I mentioned that it's at most t to a power less than one. So it's small relative to the total number of zeros, which is t over two pi log t up to height t. Okay, so that's what a zero density estimate. It's an estimate for uh, this kind of sum. And uh, you're interested in upper bounds for this when sigma is to the right of a half. So now I'm going to prove the first zero density estimate that was proved. Uh, this was, uh, let's see, I think it was Bohr and Landau who proved it. Okay, so here's what we do. You apply Littlewood's lemma uh, on the rectangle with vertices sigma naught to two plus i t, sigma naught plus i t, where sigma naught is strictly between a half and one. Okay, so here's a uh, picture. There's a picture. <coughs> Okay, so I'm interested in counting zeros uh, between sigma and two and up to height t. So these are the zeros, the ones to the right of this dotted line. Those are the ones I want to count. That's n of sigma t. I apply Littlewood's lemma by taking a slightly bigger rectangle. So I, 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 my left edge is now at sigma naught. Okay, so by Littlewood's theorem, the uh, sum of the distances of these zeros to the left edge um, is equal to 1 over 2 pi times the integral of the log on the left edge, and then there's some stuff left over that we don't care about, uh, and that's E. Okay? So now uh, our sigma is to the right of sigma naught, so the sum of the distances of all the zeros in the rectangle, the big rectangle, is bigger than or equal to the sum of the distances of some of the, of the zeros to the left edge, and the, su the zeros that I'm interested in are just the ones to the right of this dotted line, okay? So beta bigger than or equal to sigma. So this inequality is obvious. But if, if my zero row is to the right of the dotted line, it's at least this distance, sigma minus sigma naught, from the left edge, okay? So we get uh, that this sum is bigger than or equal to sigma minus sigma naught times the number of zeros to the right of sigma. Okay, and I wanted an upper bound for n of sigma t, so this is good. And uh, so, um, on the other hand, I, ha I need an upper bound for this side, and here we just use our trick that I mentioned before, put a, put a, a, a one half down here, and then, um, uh, you get log of mod zeta square on the sigma naught line, the left edge, okay? And then uh, the average of the log is less than or equal to the log of the average. That translates into this. And here we have a mean square of zeta on the sigma naught line. Remember, that is asymptotic. As long as sigma naught is bigger than a half, that's asymptotic to a constant times t. So inside here, we have 1 over t times a constant times t, so that's a constant. <coughs> and our upper bound is big O of t, some constant times t at most. All right, 
So here's the series of inequalities. We have this. <coughs> um, so our result is that the number of zeros to the right of sigma up to height t is less and less than t. If we form the proportion of zeros up to height t in the strip, you know, the, so the number in that rec smaller rectangle uh, divided by the number up to height t, you get big O of 1 over log t for any sigma that's fixed and bigger than a half. So this is saying, as t goes to infinity, that an infinitesimal proportion of the zeros of the zeta function um, in the critical strip up to height t are, um, um, are to the right of sigma, any fixed sigma. All right, so that was the first zero density estimate. Nowadays, uh, if, if, you, if you throw in mollifiers and put in, use very clever techniques, um, you can prove not just big, big O of t here, but t to a power less than one. Okay, and these are very important in the, in the subject. But I, I should point out, the basic principle you, you saw here is what you use in most of these other zero density estimates. Okay, you just refine what you're doing to save a lot. <clears throat> okay, so I hope that convinces you that, that uh, mean value estimates are, are uh, extremely important. Moments, mean values. If it didn't, then let's, let me tell you about something else that I hope will serve to convince you. So, uh, remember, n of t is the number of zeros up to height t in the critical strip. I'll call n zero the number of those zeros up to height t that are on the critical line. Okay, so um, I want to show you the, some of the ideas behind Levinson's method to prove that there are lots of zeros on the critical line. Okay, so here's a quick reminder of what I showed you yesterday. <coughs> Hardy <coughs> was the first person <coughs> to prove that there are infinitely many zeros on the critical line. Hardy and Littlewood quantified it. Selberg was the sh first to show that it's actually a positive proportion of all the zeros are on the line. Levinson uh, came up with a good uh, proportion, one-third, and uh, Connery was able to show two-fifths. <clears throat> okay, so what's behind Levinson's method? All right, this, is a, this was a very, very important um, paper uh, by Levinson uh, back in the early 70s, and it generated a lot of research. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> in the background, is a theorem from the 30s by a mathematician named Spicer. <clears throat> Spicer showed that the Riemann hypothesis is, it tells you not just that the, it's not just the zeros are on the critical line for zeta, but that it tells you something about the derivative of zeta, that it's, it doesn't vanish to the left of the critical line. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Montgomery and Levinson proved a quantitative version of this. I, I'll just give you a sketch. I've written proof here, but this is not a, an actual proof. There are some details, uh, important details I've left out. But just to give you a basic idea of what's, uh, what this is about. So their theorem is that zeta and zeta prime have the same number of zeros inside a rectangle C up to big O of log t. So log t is not much. and um, uh, uh, zeta and zeta prime, if zeta doesn't have many zeros inside a rectangle C to the left of the half line, neither does uh, zeta. So here's the kind of rectangle we're looking at. <coughs> so this goes from minus one to a half. Uh, uh, sorry, the rectangle is, the right edge of the rectangle is just to the left of a half, it's this. Okay, so the Levinson-Montgomery theorem says uh, the number of zeros of zeta and zeta prime in a rectangle like this, no matter how close this edge is to one half, uh, they'll be essentially the same, off by big O of log t.
Okay, so <clears throat> the basic idea, just quickly, is that you can show, and I'm leaving out details, the change in argument of zeta prime divided by zeta around that rectangle to the left of the critical line is big O of log t. So that's the important step. But on the other hand, the change in argument of zeta prime over zeta, argument splits as a difference here. It's the, it's the change in argument of zeta prime minus the change in argument of zeta around c. But that's 2 pi times the number of zeros of zeta prime in c minus the number of zeros of zeta in c. So the difference in the number of zeros of these two functions, zeta prime and zeta, is big O of log t. That's the basic idea. <clears throat> okay, so here's how Levinson's method goes. Okay, you start off by noticing <laughs> um, take a rec big rectangle from 2 to 2 plus i t over to minus 1 plus i t down to minus 1, <clears throat> okay? And uh, that's symmetric about the half line. <clears throat> okay, so let's say zeta prime has n prime zeros up to height t in over here, in the left side of this rectangle, okay? Well, by the Levinson-Montgomery theorem, so does zeta have that many zeros, uh, up to big O of log t, okay? So zeta prime and zeta have the same number of rectangles, more or less, here, to the left of the half line, okay? Now, zeta, the zeros of zeta are symmetric about the half line. So if zeta has 50 zeros here, it has 50 zeros here, okay? So that's not counting zeros on the half line. Okay, so um, uh, the number of zeros of zeta up to height t is the, num uh, the number of zeros on the critical line here plus twice the number of zeros of zeta here right, because the number of zeros of zeta here is the same as the number here, but the number of zeros of zeta here is the same as those, the number for zeta prime, which I, I called n prime, up to big O of log t. Okay, so uh, this is the s real starting point. The total number of zeros in this box uh, is the number on the line plus twice the number of zeros of zeta prime to the left of the line. Okay, and so solving for the number of zeros on the line, you get n of t minus twice n prime of t. But n of t, we know, that was by von Mungold, that's two, t over 2 pi log t. So if we have an upper bound for the number of zeros of zeta prime in this box, we get a lower bound for the number of zeros of zeta on the critical line. So the, what we need to do is find an upper bound for zeros of zeta prime to the left of a half. <clears throat> okay. Um, are there any questions so far? Yes. What about t? Yeah, we're interested in t going to infinity. Our very large t. Um, not infinite, but what happens as t goes to infinity? It's pretty crooked, huh? It's a pretty crooked proof.
I think I'm giving you a really hard time. I, I need to buy you a beer later. Um, okay, so uh, we're interested in the number of zeros of zeta prime here. That's the same as the number of zeros of zeta prime of one minus s here to the right. Okay, we want to transfer things to the right. Um, uh, by the functional equation for the zeta function, uh, zeta prime of, uh, this is not right. <coughs> Uh, zeta of s uh, has this, and zeta prime of 1 minus s, let's see, zeta of s and zeta prime of 1 minus s have the same number of zeros here. Right, because zeta of s has the same number of zeros here as it has here. That's roughly the same number of zeros of zeta prime here. So that's the number of zeros of zeta prime of 1 minus s here. Okay. Okay. But uh, just, uh, so here's a simple exercise from the functional equation for the zeta function. Uh, you can, if you define this function g of s as zeta plus zeta prime divided by log of s, basically, log s over 2 pi, <clears throat> then uh, um, zeta prime of 1 minus s here has the same zeros as g here, okay? So that means that uh, we can apply Littlewood's uh, lemma to zeta prime of 1 minus s, but we could also do it to g as well, and, and uh, that's, that's better, turns out. I'm sorry, Steve. Yes. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there you can count them with multiplicity. Um, okay, so we're ready to apply Littlewood's lemma to G. Okay, um, so our rectangle, uh, we're, we're interested in zeros of g to the right of a half, okay, so these, these three guys here. <clears throat> we take a rectangle slightly to the left, so this a will be a half minus a constant over log t, and then at the end of the method you, you optimize, you figure out what the best value of c is. <clears throat> okay, so. Littlewood's lemma says that uh, 1 over 2 pi, the integral of log g on this left edge, apart from an error term, is the sum of the distances of the zeros inside of this rectangle CA. They're distances from the left edge. So I've called the zeros rho prime. And um, um, <clears throat> I actually... So let, let me go through it like this first. Um, okay, so that's just little wood applied to G. Now that's bigger than or equal to the sum of the distances of the zeros of G to the right of a half, okay? Because we're counting fewer positive terms here than here. So we get an inequality like that. But the zeros that are to the right of a half, these guys, are at least a half minus A from the A line. So we get an inequality like this. Okay, now, uh, <clears throat> we then have to evaluate the integral of log g. And our trick is to use Cauchy-Schwartz, uh, uh, sorry, uh, uh, to, <laughs> to use, um, you know, the average of the log is less than or equal to the log of the uh, average. Okay. Um, but when we apply that inequality, we're going to lose if we don't do something at this point. Namely, 
Um, I want to regularize, so what I said about the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality applies to this arithmetic geometric mean or Jensen inequality that, I, that I'm uh, using here too. <clears throat> if I just apply, if, if I, uh, you know, change, go to an upper bound for this integral uh, of, uh, you know, say this is less than or equal to the uh, log of the average, I'm going to lose a lot unless I smooth out G. So what I want to do is smooth G by an appropriate um, um, Dirichlet polynomial. And more or less, it'll be like 1 over zeta. Okay, so I want to put that in there uh, at that point, at this point. <clears throat> okay, uh, now if I do that, this might have some zeros. So this equality here isn't exactly correct. So th these are now zeros of G times M sub N. And similarly, here, okay, all right, um, but the, the final inequality here still holds because there's more zeros in this last sum um, than, um, uh, there may be more zeros than there were originally, okay? So if I just count the zeros of uh, G, that's a valid inequality. Okay. So we insert a mollifier like that. Now we apply the trick, <clears throat> the trick of um, the average of the log is less than, well, put in the log of GM square. The average of the log is less than or equal to the uh, log of the average, so we get this. And uh, the M you used, that Levinson used, was uh, exactly this, okay? So th it's like one over zeta. And uh, then most of Levinson's paper, it's a rather long technical paper, most of the paper is, is the, you know, the difficulty is computing these kinds of uh, mean values, all right? Very, very technical work. <clears throat> okay, so you do that, and, um, <clears throat> you know, we know mean value theorems <clears throat> of this sort now, and you get the result, okay? So those are the basic ideas in Levinson's method. Okay, let me uh, just uh, remind you, so Levinson, by just <coughs> calculating uh, what I showed you, uh, the, the number of zeros is at least a third of those in the box up to high T. Brian uh, improved that some years later to two-fifths. Um, the formulas for the mean value, G times M, that you get have a theta in them, and, and the formula is the same in both cases, Levinson's and Brian's, uh, but Brian was able to use more high-power methods than Levinson had at that time to uh, show that you could take theta bigger. Uh, David Farmer uh, gave, uh, I think, a compelling argument <coughs> that the, the formula, if you take the theta that occurs in the formula of Levinson and Bryan and you let it be arbitrarily large, that the formula should still hold. We're nowhere near proving something like that. But if it does, then uh, the number of zeros on the critical line is asymptotic, at least, uh, to the number that are in the box up to height t. Okay. Um, okay, let me just take two more minutes and uh, give you one final quick uh, idea of an application. <clears throat> okay, I mentioned discrete mean value Theorems. Here's so here's a <clears throat> here's an application to simple zeros. Um, if you let n sub s be the number of zeros of the zeta function for which zeta prime is not zero, okay, then we think all the zeros. Many of us think all the zeros are simple. So uh, many of us believe that all the zeros up to height t in the critical strip are on the line, and they're simple. 
Uh, Montgomery, using his pair correlation ideas, showed that two-thirds of the zeros are simple on RH. Um, in the late 90s, uh, Conry Ghosh and I uh, proved that, uh, that if you assume RH and the generalized Lindelof hypothesis, then the number of simple zeros is at least 70 percent of the number of zeros. So improving Montgomery a little bit from 0.666 to uh, 0.703. Now, it turned out, so our, our original proof uh, assumed not the generalized Lindelof hypothesis. That means Lindelof for, for all Dirichlet L functions. It assumed the generalized Riemann hypothesis. And uh, uh, so that this is a, a weaker hypothesis. So, but it turned out that this was, uh, there was a technical error in our proof of this. That error, I don't think, was there in the, in the GRH. Right, Brian? You'll back me up. Uh, yeah, we, we nailed it uh, if we were given GRH. Okay? We never published that proof, but um, you know, we were young and ambitious, so we wanted to do GLH, and we got it slightly wrong. Uh, however, very recently, Hung Bui and Heath Brown revisited that paper and uh, got around the problem we had, and they proved uh, they were able to finally establish this um, same result, uh, just and just assuming our age. So uh, on our age, at least 70 percent of the zeros are simple. <clears throat> so let me show you the idea behind our and their uh, method. It just takes one brief page. Okay, so <clears throat> if you look at this, look at the sum of zeta prime at the zeros. So we're assuming our age. So all the zeros are half plus i gamma. Okay, so look at the mean square of this. By Cauchy-Schwartz, this is uh, less than or equal to the sum of uh, 1 times the sum of zeta prime mod square summed over the zeros. Now, <clears throat> this is initially a sum over all the zeros that I have here. But if a zero is multiple, zeta prime is zero. So I don't really need to count a term, a 1 here, if, if the zero is multiple. So I can restrict to simple zeros. Okay? But then if you can evaluate this, means, this mean value and this one, then you get a lower bound for the number of simple zeros. Okay? That's the basis of, of the thing. And um, that's what you do. And so it's, you know, uh, uh, it's, it's carrying out those mean values, or at least the, uh, the mean square, is uh, quite difficult and uh, uh, but you can do it, and uh, it gives, gives you a result on simple zeros. Okay, I'll stop there.